See our town this weekend, Friday and Saturday at seven, and Sunday at just, two. Just Ticket, Saturday. shut up, Marcus. <laughs> Tickets are seven dollars at the door. See you there. Alex, Marcus will find well, you. Let's be serious though. The only person who's actually going to listen to this is Katie, and she already knows that. So. <laughs> that one guy who commented. That's true. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, a guy named a guy named. Wait a minute. I got. I got to check his exact username. For <laughs> Because it was entertaining, so I gotta make sure I get his name right. He wants more videos. Shout out to the guy that commented on the last video. Ooh, Blossoms777. Hello. So, what did he say? He liked my, uh, he or she liked my, um, what about uh, adding vectors, breaking up the components, and that, yeah. But the, uh, the comment was. Listen, man. <laughs> Listen, man. This is truly the best vector video I have viewed. Just like the twenty, just like twenty MDM said. Apparently, another guy got it. I seriously thank you very much. You are the best in all capitals, by the way. Um, I am confident going forward in this topic. There you go. So, so if any of you would care to continue. Now I don't, now I, I don't, I just, one of you, I know it is, but, you know, so no, it's probably you, because you're serious, so. I don't have a YouTube account. Uh, no, you don't, but Blossom777 does. So. You should so. go become like that other guy who makes so. those videos. You think so? Blossom777. Yeah. Yeah. Now I, now I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't give them snappy names that. anymore, like I, I actually called them one edition of non-perpendicular vectors. Now it just says, like, physics. Uh, February twenty second. That's what like what it call what I call it now. So because well, it's just lazy and I don't want to change the name of it. But yeah, kind of like kind of because it's kind of creeping me out a little bit that people are just out there searching my videos. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe he just like, needed help with it. I, I, that may be, but maybe yeah. you have the top vector video. You should sponsor like a food sponsor. You can get and then he food. Oh, I know. YouTube keeps telling me that I can monetize my videos. So he's keep, every couple days, like, hey, you could make money off of this. And like, School board might frown upon that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But you could donate it to your students. Cedar Point. <laughs> I suppose you I should. Pay Cedar Point to Next open year's early. physics students. No. No. Not this year's. Or that was Kimmy funded. Better right there. I'll be there. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, I'll just accept all the Alright. So, <laughs> calendar. <laughs> Yesterday. Yesterday, you guys took quiz, and uh, most of us did pretty well on the quiz. We went over a couple of the prop. We went over a couple of the answers in class yesterday. Uh, there's one. There's actually a couple of the questions that we didn't answer in class that we'll kind of answer at the beginning of class indirectly today. Um, so that's there. Uh, Energy Lab. Um, like I kind of I mentioned to you guys yesterday, I'm not going to get to those anytime like before next week. So if you haven't turned in that lab with the pendulum and throwing the ball up in the air. It's okay, just don't forget about it, and you know, comes end of the quarter and you haven't turned it in yet. So make sure that gets in. Okay. Yes, sir. How do you get that like notepad? Copy and paste. But there's like a bunch of crap. When I opened it, it's like calibration something. Oh, you you, you can just like a ton of like because like when we did it with velocity, it was just like a, you know like it was normal. Yeah. This time there's like a bunch of brackets and mm -hmm. arrows. Are you opening it up in Word pad or? Okay. Say open with, and it should give you a couple of options. Yeah, it has like notepad. Check it out. And if you check it out. If it's not there, then come see me and we'll talk. So I know these computers here have it, but these computers are like you know, 14 years old. I don't know whatever. So, but maybe, maybe it's an antiquated system that you know. So. But it's a text file, so you have to get it out of text. Right. Into, yeah. You know, it works with like glossy. Just copied the velocity values. No, like when we had a back, like when we had, like we had a computer with graph with words. Yeah. And it was with like the velocity and the acceleration. Yeah. But, uh, I figured that out. This one has like words, mm. like a lot of words, brackets, and arrows, mm. really long decimal points that gotcha. I don't really know where they. I'll have 
I'll take a look at it because I don't know it doesn't sound familiar, but okay. sorry. All right. Uh, today, yeah, or sorry, yesterday we talked about we introduced the idea of non-conservative force in the work energy theorem. We'll continue on with that today and do a couple of example problems where we have to use work energy theorem and the idea of non-conservative force in order to solve for something about our situation. Then if we fast forward to next week. Uh, we fast forward to next week. Uh, Monday, I'll give you the guys day in class to wrap up some things, review some stuff. If you want to work on note cards, you can do that maybe. Do some other review problems, questions. And we're looking at test on Tuesday. So test on Tuesday is definitely a uh, more even mix of conceptual questions and problems than the previous test was. Seeing as how there weren't hardly any conceptual questions on the previous test. So make sure you got some concept stuff down. There's definitely problems on the calendar from the book that deal with concepts. If you have a problem with those, talk about them on Monday or some other time. Okay. Good there? All right. Let's take a look to start off at this video. So here's a video posted to YouTube of some girl who was foolish enough to listen to her physics teacher. Okay. First, uh, this guy being the physics teacher, obviously buys his shirts and physics teachers are us. So I've tried to, I've tried to branch out a little bit from wearing shirts like this because it was just a little too stereotypical. So you told I, us I, did I tell you guys this video? Yeah, yeah. Did I show you this video? The same yeah. I swear that was the other class. Your next joke is going to be about the hair. <laughs> I swear I told I swear I showed this to the other class. Never mind that. Without further delay. Oh, I thought I saw it's Blossom 777 didn't get to hear the hair jokes. Anyway. Now he knows what you look like though. That's true. So Alright. So anyway. We let it go, right? So, did we show the uh, did we show the graphs with the different energy types and everything? Yeah. 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 All right then. All right. So that leads us to this. Did we get this? Is this where we left off on? Okay. All right. So yesterday we introduced the idea of the non-conservative <laughs> force, whereas. Earlier in the week, we talked about conservative force. Sorry. Shut up. Does everyone have a copy of that problem set, too? Did you guys see the copy? Did you see the problem set? All right. Earlier in the week, we talked about conservative force. And we said that there are basically two kinds of conservative forces. Do you remember what those two kinds of conservative forces are? Gravity. Gravity's one. And then, like, elastic springy, rubber bandy kind of stuff, even though in the previous class somebody asked, and even those aren't perfect, um, but close, closer than other kinds of forces. But everything else falls into the category of a non-conservative force. So things like friction and contact forces, where you're actually pushing or pulling or hitting something, uh, air resistance, which is similar to friction, Tension, got like a string, pull somebody, all of those would be non conservative forces. Basically anything other than gravity and spring stuff. <coughs> Why is that important? That's important. Sorry, can you write this down? I think I intentionally skipped this slide yesterday because I didn't necessarily want you to write it down, but that's all right. So. The big idea with the conservative forces is that while we may change the type of energy that an object has from one form into another, the total amount of mechanical energy remains the same. So reviewing from yesterday, right, and looking at this graph, if gravity really was the only force acting on that pendulum, this red dotted line, right, would remain flat because the mechanical energy would remain constant the entire time. 
and the blue dotted line would come back up to the red dashed line every single time when it was flat because it wouldn't lose any mechanical energy. But this is what it looks like in the real world, where red dash dots representing heat energy, that friction is now taking some of the mechanical energy and turning it into other things. Right? But the green line representing total mechanical energy, or sorry, not total mechanical energy, total energy remains constant. Okay? What does friction actually do to that mechanical energy, or how much of it? That comes back here to our work energy theorem. That when work is done on an object, there is a resulting change in the mechanical energy. How much work we do tells about how much change in mechanical energy there is. We can rewrite that equation to look something like this, where all we did was separate delta ME, right? It's final minus initial. You bring initial over to the other side. You start off with a certain amount of mechanical energy, mechanical energy initial, plus whatever work that we do by a non-conservative force. That's the NC subscript, non-conservative. And you end up with some amount of final mechanical energy. Good? All right, so let's see how this works in an actual real situation. So from this problem set, non-conservative forces and work energy theorem, let's take a look at number one. Let's take a look at number one. All right, so number one says, a 17 kilogram child starts from rest at the top of a slide that is 3.5 meters above the ground. At the bottom, the kid is traveling with a speed of 2.5 meters per second. How much work was done by friction as the kid travels down the slide? So, starting off, what is this question asking us for? Work, right? It says, how much work? Slide. Just so you know. <laughs> All right. 
this height that they gave us, the 3.5 meters, is dependent upon our reference point. Where is probably the easiest place to put the reference point in this problem? Probably at the bottom, okay? Does it have to be at the bottom? No, we can actually put it anywhere we want to. But it probably makes it easier to put it at the bottom in this problem, and that means that this 3.5 is going to be which height? This is going to be, yeah, but that's going to be your initial height, right? It will be positive because it's above the reference point too, okay? And that means that the final height is going to be equal to what? Zero. Other things they gave us. Which one? They actually gave us both, right? They told us that at the bottom of the slide, 2.5 meters per second. And at the top of the slide, what? Zero, right? Starts from rest. Means that V initial equals zero. All right, good there? Now, let's take this equation and make it fit our specific problem here. If we take a look at the beginning of the situation, not where this kid is in the picture, but at the beginning of the situation, we said that mechanical energy is a combination of three things, right? What three things? Potential gravitational, potential elastic, and kinetic. At the beginning of this problem, does this kid have kinetic energy? No. It says that V initial is equal to zero. Okay. Does the kid have gravitational potential energy? It starts somewhere above the reference point. Okay? So there will definitely be some initial gravitational potential energy. Anything stretched or compressed in this problem? No, so we don't have to worry about elastic potential energy. So the only kind of energy to begin with is initial gravitational potential. Then we do some work. And we end up with a certain amount of mechanical energy at the end. So if we take a look at this kid at the end of the slide, right? Is there kinetic energy at the end of this problem? Definitely, right? They gave us a final velocity. So we know there's going to be some final kinetic energy. Okay. Any gravitational potential? Because this kid ends up at the reference point, right? Where y final being equal to zero. Okay. Any elastic potential energy? No. So our equation, like we said, the initial equation starts like this. But then we have to take it and say, OK, how does that equation specifically apply to this problem? Okay. Now we start plugging in things we know. We know that this is mg times y initial plus the amount of work that we do. This is 1 half mv final squared. right? And if you go and plug in things you know, there's only one unknown in this equation, and that's work. And that's what we're solving for. So go ahead and plug those things in and find out what you get.
equation, you should end up with a value of negative 530.57. We good with that number? Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about this number. First, is it okay that it's negative? Yeah. Yeah. Two reasons. One, which way does friction act on an object? Always opposite, right? So that we said that when we first introduced the concept of work, forces that act opposite of motion are going to do negative work. Second, we sort of established yesterday, what does friction do to the mechanical energy that an object has? Decreases. It decreases it because it turns it into what? Heat. Heat. Okay? So the idea here being that when you go down the slide, some of that potential energy that you started with at the top gets turned into heat. And that's the case, right? I mean, it's, if you slide down the slide, right, especially in the summertime, you know, you don't sit exactly right, and you get that nice little burn on your leg, right? That feels good. So, you know, good times, good times. Because I slide down slides a lot. So, actually, probably more than you. Yeah, totally it was her. It was her that turned around and saw it falling, yes. So, I actually probably, I actually probably slide down slides more than you guys do. My kids, my kids make me do it. So. <laughs> anyway, finishing this problem off though. First, sig digs. If we look back at all of our numbers, how many significant digits in our numbers? How many significant digits in any of those numbers? Two. Two, right? Two, 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 zero doesn't count, right? So we're gonna round this here to negative 530, no decimal point. Right, because the decimal point makes that zero negative. Okay. Unit joules, because energy is measured in joules and work is just energy being transferred. Questions? Good there? Alright. Well, let's take a look at number two. Let's take a look at number two. Now, as far as number two is concerned, I'm going to make a little modification here. I'm going to get rid of part A, just like it never happened. It was never there. So if you just want to cross it out of your sheet, go ahead and do so. Because part B is um, more similar to the kind of problem you'd see on a test. So let's just go with that. So it says, two-man bobsled has a mass of 390 kilograms. Starting from rest, two racers push the sled horizontally with a force of 270 newtons for a distance of 50 meters. Part B says, if the track is frictionless, how fast is the sled going at the end of this push? So, it says frictionless in this problem, but is this a conservation problem? How would they push it if it's frictionless? The track is frictionless. And they have, they have spikes that stick into it. And this is not a real problem. So, can't do it. Logic. But it makes but it makes it a lot harder if you throw friction into this problem. So, you know. And you guys are just learning. It's just the beginning. I just thought I'd I know. Yeah. And it was on recording, too. So. so, this is a fictitious problem, not based on real data. I will admit it right now. Okay? So. But, but did I trust you? What? You didn't, you didn't know that you couldn't trust me until right now? if I never lied to you before. So just wait when we talk about when we talk about relativity at the end of the year and I just tell you, yeah, hey remember the whole year you spent learning this stuff? It's not really right. So what if you're lying to us now? Could be. Maybe <laughs> maybe Newtonian mechanics is perfectly right. There's evidence to suggest otherwise, but okay, whatever. So anyway, that's glad we got that on recording. So you guys gotta make Katie mad. She's She's freaking out right now because she's like, why doesn't he just get to the problem? <laughs> you guys know this is for you, Katie. Fifteen. <laughs> 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 Let's just sit here in silence for like five more minutes. <laughs> uh, all right. So. What? Why are we talking about it? Because she's not here. Because she's the only one who's gonna watch this recording. <laughs> Let's refer to ourselves. <laughs> All right. Let's see. We have little captions at the bottom. All right. It says if the track is.
frictionless. <laughs> We've already established that this is not an actual problem. But because this check is frictionless, does that mean it's a conservation problem? No. No, because there's another force, right? The two-man bobsled people pushing this, right? So that is a non-conservative force. It's not gravity or elastic. So that means this problem will start off just like this. Okay. Now, that being the case, let's go and attack it in the usual fashion. What are we looking for in this problem? VF. VF, right? How fast is going at the end of the push? So VF equals question mark. Things we know. Yes. Okay, they gave us the mass of this bobsled. What else? VI. They gave us VI, right? Starting from rest. Okay, they gave us the distance that the bobsled was pushed. And they gave us the force that was being applied to that bobsled as it was being pushed. Okay. Good? All right. Like we said, this problem starts with this equation, but now we have to make it fit our specific problem. Okay? Oh, one other thing. Notice what variable that we've been show that has been showing up in pretty much every problem doesn't show up here. There are no what's in this list of things we know. There are no heights, there are no y's over here. Okay? Because what does it tell you about how this sled is moving? Horizontally, right? That means if we make the track our reference point, does it go anywhere from the reference point? Y initial and Y final would both be the same. So like we said, we could just put our reference point wherever we wanted to, but it really makes sense to put it in the on the long track, because now Y initial and Y final would then both be what? Zero, Zero and we wouldn't have to worry about it. Okay? So, what kind of, or if we take a look at the beginning, right, ME initial, is there any kinetic energy at the beginning of this problem? No, right, we got V initial equals zero, right? Is there any gravitational potential in this problem? No, because we talked about that the horizontal part, no change in height. Anything being stretched or compressed? No. So what's the total initial mechanical energy? Just zero, and that's fine. That's okay. Then we do some work. What kind of energy does this sled end up with? Then there's definitely kinetic energy, right? Because it wants us to find the final velocity. All right? So definitely kinetic. We've already established that we don't have to worry about potential gravitational. Any elastic potential at the end? No. So this equation just simplifies down for this problem into work equals Ke final. Earlier in this unit, we talked about that the amount of work that's done depends on a couple of things. In this problem, how did we calculate how much work was done? We looked at what? The mechanical energy, and more specifically the change in mechanical energy. That's one way we can figure out work. But we also said there's another way that we can figure out how much work is done, right? Depending on the what. Depending on the force and depending on the distance, that can also determine how much work is done here, right? And we already know that the kinetic energy depends on the mass and the velocity. Now, do we have enough information to figure out how fast this object is going at the end of the 50 meters? We do.
32? Okay. All right. So there's our final velocity. Somebody earlier asked, up on the board, this equation looks like this. They said, well, why don't we use that formula? We said that only forces that are parallel to the direction of mov movement actually do work. Does that sound familiar from way back in, way back when we first started introducing work? This cosine theta automatically builds in for us the horizontal component. Theta being the angle between we're pushing and which way that object is going. So in the case of this problem, those guys are pushing like this, but then the sled is moving like this. So what's the angle between those two things? That's zero. Cosine of zero? One. So all of this force, all of this F sub A, is going into making work into the sled. If they were pushing somehow, like, if they were pushing somehow, like, this, right, that they were kind of pushing down as it was moving forward, right, now this whole force wouldn't go to doing work, right? We said that that force has components like this and like this, and only the horizontal component does work. That's where this theta comes in. Now, do you have to do that when you're calculating work? No, you could just manually calculate the horizontal component and do it that way. That's up to you. Good? Ah, let's see if we can squeeze one more in here before the end. <coughs> let's look at number six. Number six. So number six says, on a frozen pond, a person kicks a 10 kilogram sled, giving it an initial speed of 2.2 meters per second. How far does the sled move before stopping if the coefficient of friction between the sled and the ice is 0 0.100. Zero. Darn you coefficient of friction. First. Because it mentions the coefficient of friction, this is going to be a work energy problem. Right? Question is asking us for what? Question is asking us for a distance. Okay. It gives us the mass of the sled. It gives us that initially the sled was traveling at 2.2 meters per second. And that eventually this sled is going to stop. It also gives us that the coefficient of kinetic friction is equal to 0 0.100. Good there? Ice. Shiny red sled. There we go, right? And this sled moving along in that direction. It was kicked by this big boot over here. <laughs> Right? But no longer touching the sled. Okay. So as it's rolling or as it's sliding along here, if we take a look at forces, what forces would be acting on this sled? There's definitely gravity. You can't get rid of that. That's there. And based on the information they gave us, we know that this gravitational force should be 98.1. Okay? What else? Normal force. In this case, even though it doesn't specifically say we can assume that the ice is horizontal, what would that mean about the normal force in this problem? It's got to be the same as gravity. Okay? So move that up here. And that also, 98.1. One other force. Okay? This object is traveling to the right. That means there is a kinetic friction force acting on it towards the left. Because friction always acts opposite of stuff. Is it 0 0.1? No. It is not 0 0.1. 
That's not the force of friction. That's the coefficient of friction. But seeing as how we know the coefficient, we know the normal force. Looks like that. We can plug in, find out that that frictional force is equal to 9.81. Good there? I know I'm going fast, but I'm trying to get this done. I'm not going to, but. Any other forces? Is there a force pushing this sled forward? There was back when this boot was kicking it, yes? But now that it has left the boot, is there a force pushing it forward? It continues forward, why? Inertia, right? But it's going forward, there's a force pushing backward, what's eventually gonna happen? It's gonna stop. I will finish this up, I'm recording on my own. The rest of those problems, answers are posted to those problems on the calendar, so you can check them out. Monday, time in class for review stuff, Tuesday tests. Okay, so we, just to finish this up, we just established that those are the only three forces that are acting on that sled as it slides across the ice and comes to rest. Like I said, there was a force towards the right when the boot was actually kicking it, but now it's gone. Earlier in this unit, we talked about that these two forces, the gravity and the normal force, first, they cancel each other out. That wasn't from earlier in this unit. But second, they are perpendicular to the way that the sled is moving. Perpendicular forces don't do work on an object. So that means the only force now doing work on that object is the gravitation, or sorry, the frictional force. So we can now establish that the force of kinetic friction is equal to 9.81. So, as we said earlier, we know that this is a work energy problem because there is a non-conservative force, that non-conservative force being friction acting on that object. Starting off at the beginning of this project, or problem, the sled is moving, so there is some kinetic energy at the beginning. Just like in the last problem, if we call this our reference point, the level of the ice, if we call the level of the ice our reference point, the object starts at the ice and ends at the ice from a height standpoint, and the height being zero for both of them, so we don't have to worry about any potential gravitational energy in this problem. There is no elastic potential energy, so the only kind of energy at the beginning of this problem is kinetic. Then some work gets done. Eventually, that object ends up stopping, right? V final zero, so there is no kinetic energy at the end of this problem. We've already established the fact that because the ice is height zero, there is no final potential gravitational energy, no elastic potential, so in this case, the object ends with zero energy, mechanical energy. So then we sub in 1 half mv initial squared plus f times d equals zero. You can sub in the things that you know, and if you do that, you'll end up with a negative 2.47 meters. Which is weird, because it shouldn't go backwards, right? But keep in mind, looking at our picture, this object, the sled, is moving to the right. But friction is acting on it to the left. So we talk about, in that case, Forces that oppose the motion do negative work. So we can bring that back into our equation by saying, okay, this isn't positive work, it's actually negative work. And if you do that, this will end up being positive. That's an important idea to make sure that you understand the whole idea that negative work affects the object differently than positive work. Go from there. 
So like I said at the end of class, before the bell rang, if you look on today's date on the calendar, February 22nd, you'll see that, oh, you'll see that down here, there is a link to all of the answers to that problem set. There's also some problems from the book. You don't have access to those answers, but they do apply to this section. So Monday, time for questions or uh, note cards in class. Test on Tuesday.